Jin repeated himself, telling Veridin to keep his mouth shut. He was too talkative. Veridin Zippel laughed. Jin sounded just like his father. Jin replied that in his place, everyone would say so. He asked why the Zippel family had come to the banquet uninvited. Veridin kindly explained to him. It was because of him. He continued to annoy his uncle Andre by wanting to see Jean. They were just on vacation in the Hoofester area when Veridin heard about the Rankhandle family banquet, and then he realized that it was fate. Jin was speechless. He told Veridin to be grateful that it was a banquet. Jin wanted him to be quiet and then leave. Jin waved his hand as if chasing away an annoying fly. Wasn't he too cold? Veridin knew that Jean's father had shown mercy to his uncle Andre. Since Jin mentioned it, what about the promise? Veridin said that Jin should also come to the Zippel banquet without warning. What if Jin commits a terrorist act? Veridin grinned. Even if Jin does that, he won't kill him. If a fight starts, he will not take part in it. Jin thought that Veridin was a silly romantic. Jin said that an unpleasant guy had been staring at him for some time. He walked towards this man. It was Balber Gaston. Jin asked him if the man wanted to say something to him. Vishkal was not with him. He was looking around the banquet hall with his sister. That's why Balber could behave so casually and without consequences. Until now, that is. Uber asked about when the moon would come. He wanted to give her a notebook, inside of which were poems that he had been writing all night. Uber said that he filled them with his love. Uber was sure that when Luna reads his poems, she will understand that he is better than he looks at first glance. He also said that perhaps in the near future Jin will become his brother-in-law. At that moment, he blushed and giggled. Uber overstepped his limits and angered Jin. Even Veridin, who was silently watching this conversation while sipping from his glass, couldn't help but spit out his wine after hearing these words. Jin took the papers from Buber's hands and tore them into four pieces. The thick stack was easily torn, like a thin cloth. It looked like his dear guest needed a good beating. Buber not only mentioned his sister's name, but also dared to call him his brother-in-law. Does the Rankhandle family look pathetic in his eyes? If they hadn't been in the banquet hall, Jin would have immediately torn the guest's tongue out of his mouth. Uber accidentally called Jin brother-in-law again, and the boy, under the influence of the moment, almost punched Buber in the face. However, he closed his eyes and calmed his anger before raising his hand and summoning the guardian knights. Two guard knights standing at the edge of the hall grabbed Buber by the shoulder. Buber still didn't understand why Jin was seething with anger. Buber continued to scream as he was dragged away, but Jin didn't respond. It wasn't that Jin had nothing to say to this worthless man in return. As they slowly approached the arena, Buber felt like a cattle being dragged to the slaughterhouse. Five years ago, Jin left the Tempest Castle. Radical followers of the Zipples disguised themselves as the guardian knights of the Rankhandle family and tried to kill Jin. The culprit of their perfect disguise was Bauber Gaston. Although he was associated with Kinzilo, he often lent a helping hand to the followers of the Zipples. Because of his personality, Buber helped out anyone if he was going to commit acts that would cause chaos in the world. Of course, if he himself was not in danger. Did Jin find out about this? But Bauber quickly dismissed the idea. In fact, no one in the world knew that Buber was the culprit of the attack five years ago, as he was informed that the followers of the Zipples who asked him for help had failed their mission and died. Jin coldly stated that the duel would be hand to hand. Vishkal Iveliano accidentally returned from a walk in the garden. As soon as he saw the spectacle involving Buber, he was greatly shocked and looked in amazement. Buber caused trouble in the short time during which the brother and sister were absent. Bishkal was sure that Buber had asked Jin to introduce him to Lady Luna, talking about such nonsense as love and marriage. As soon as Vishkal successfully carried out Kinzilo's great master plan, he vowed to tear this pig apart and brutally kill it. Bishkal decided to come closer. Margella seemed happy to see Buber and Jin fight. The siblings weren't the only ones heading into the arena. Ceres also watched what was happening in front of her with Murekin in her arms. She was annoyed. She tried to challenge Jin to a duel during the banquet. But then why was he fighting with a guy like Buber? Her annoyance was not surprising. Although she wasn't sure if she could beat Jin even if they fought again, she wanted to continue fighting him in several duels until the end of the banquet. At that moment, Veridin came up to her, who wanted to meet her. Ceres told him to fuck off. A duel was announced. The rising star of the Rankhandle family will participate in this duel. Hearing this, the audience cheered like crazy. Most of the audience did not recognize Buber, but even though his name was little known, no one looked down on him. They believed that anyone who was worthy of coming to the banquet would be strong. They wondered if this Buber was a master hermit. Veridin told Ceres that Buber had come with members of the Iveliano family. Buber Voper looks can be an experienced fighter. Buber shouted to be given the opportunity to officially introduce himself. Jin didn't care about his insignificant name. Before the host could announce the start of the fight, Jin rushed to his opponent. The audience came to the conclusion that Buber had slapped Jin seriously, behaving inappropriately, not expecting a sudden attack. Buber was hit in the face and retreated a couple of steps back. 
When he winced in pain, dirty words and curses instinctively burst out of his mouth. But Baber was no fool. Although it wasn't widely known, he was a sixth-rank martial artist. His fist flew forward with an incredible speed that could not be expected from a burly man like him. Although his strike seemed quite simple and unsophisticated, Buber's hand was shrouded in a piercing aura, a tough counterattack, but Jin calmly avoided the blow. At first glance, Buber's aura seemed much more destructive and powerful than Jin's. The audience was a little disappointed, as Buber turned out to be weaker than expected, but they still watched with excitement since he was stronger than Jin. Buber's subsequent hook hit Jin squarely in the jaw. Jin felt his legs go weak, and a grin appeared on Buber's face. However, Buvard's smile did not last long. The stumbling genie should have fallen face first to the floor, but instead he pounced on Buber with his arm pulled back and bloodlust in his eyes. He definitely saw Jin's legs losing strength. However, it was just a bluff. The blessed bodies of the rank handles will not collapse from a simple blow to the jaw. If Buber had fought rank handle earlier, he would not have let his guard down after a successful strike. Jin hit Buber in the face with his palm, and a heavy blow echoed through the arena. Buber's nose was flattened and twisted, and a trickle of blood was running down his chin. However, he didn't have time to moan in pain. The rank handle's fighting style was to show less and less mercy as the enemy was defeated. Another blow on the broken nose, one on the left cheek, on the right side, on the solar plexus. Jin's two aura-covered fists pummeled Buber mercilessly, and it was far from the end. In fact, Jin behaved somewhat sensibly. If it had been another rank handle, Buber would have been hacked to death on the spot before he could finish brother-in-law, even if they were in the banquet hall. Veridin enthusiastically supported Jin. A young girl's voice was heard among the audience. It was Margella. She turned to Vishkal, saying that she was disgusted by Jin's actions. Isn't it obvious who won? The girl could not believe that Jin could beat a man like that after he had already lost. According to her, it is unfair for the young master of the rank handle family to find fault with a weak person. Besides, was her brother going to just sit and watch? Bauber Gaston was their friend. Vishkal, shocked, stared at his younger sister in a daze. Margella reproached Vishkal, saying that she was disappointed in him. She wanted her brother to teach Jin a lesson using a much more noble method. Bauber Gaston. This unpleasant man was neither weaker than Jin, nor their friend. Vishkal wanted to say something like that, but he couldn't, because the words of his only sister weighed on his mind. The other spectators also wanted to see the duel. In the end, Vishkal went down on stage because of his sister, the pressure and the expectations of the audience. He asked Jin to let Buber Gaston go and fight him. Vishkal Iveliano was known as the Knight of the Seventh, but in fact he had already reached the Eighth. In other words, he was an insurmountable opponent of the current Jin. A duel with a Knight of the Seventh rank. It was a great opportunity for Jin. Regardless of whether he wins or loses, the battle will greatly affect his reputation in a positive way. As long as he seemed like a good fighter to the audience, it was good for him. Besides, Iveliano's sword experience would be a great opportunity to learn it. Even Shiron considered the previous patriarch Iveliano a powerful man worthy of respect, so Jin always wanted to meet the swordsmen of this family. However, Margella Iveliano, what a funny lady. Jin was well aware that the woman was enjoying this situation. The moral duty she mentioned was just a pretense. Her goal was just to watch an interesting battle, or she liked to put her brother in unpleasant situations and watch him get out of it. Whatever her real intentions were, Jin didn't like it very much. Jin noted that Vishkal seemed to cherish his sister very much. Vishkal replied that it was self-evident. As someone who also has a sister, Jin fully understood his feelings. The moon was important to Jin, so Jin said he wanted Vishkal to keep an eye on his servants from now on. Vishkal replied that perhaps Jin misunderstood one point. The man he made mincemeat out of is not a servant, but their companion. Perhaps Bauber Gaston made some mistake. Bieber was present only to help his sister, who has difficulty moving around. Vishkal also said that Buber's abilities were not exactly suitable for a rank handle banquet. Whatever it was, Vishkal expressed confidence that Buber had no bad intentions, so Jin should not pay attention to his actions. Vishkal pretended that he didn't know anything and asked Jin to explain himself, despite the fact that he knew what kind of offense Buber most likely committed. Meanwhile, Jin was stunned when he heard the name Buber Gaston. It wasn't an ordinary name. He beat this man without even asking his name, because of his arrogance. But to think that this is the same Buber Gasta, Buber Gaston and Vishkal Iveliano, what is their relationship? Jin's brain began to accelerate, and his thought process accelerated. When Buber was captured and arrested in his previous life, there was not a single news that the Iveliano family was involved in the crimes of the magician of reincarnation. Does Vishkal know that Buber is a magician of reincarnation? Jin had found Buber Gaston, but now he had even more questions. In any case, Jin didn't have enough time to get all the answers. Right now, countless eyes were watching them, and Jin was still standing face to face with Vishkul. 
He couldn't afford to be distracted when his opponent was rank 7. Jin decided to focus on the duel. The duel has begun. Jin realized the truth as soon as their blades collided for the first time. Judging by the impact, Vishkul's strength was more than the 7th rank. It was Jin's intuition. Needless to say, Vishkul just didn't use his full strength. However, his swordsmanship and the trajectory of the blade were unusual. Jin could even tell that Vishkul's swordsmanship was as profound as his uncle's Ed's. He couldn't explain it properly, but Jin realized as soon as their swords collided that Vishkul was hiding his true skills. Vishkul's blade moved like a whip and cut Jin's shoulder. The wound was not deep, but blood spurted out of it and sprinkled the arena floor. Jin tried to avoid the next attacks, but was wounded in the thigh. Vishkul's blade flew in unpredictable trajectories, and the boy could not understand his opponent's fencing with his current skill. The Iviliano family's fencing was tricky and irregular. Those who have experienced this insidious style before have always tried to avoid meeting another Iviliano swordsman in their lives. Faridin grinned. In such situations, the rank handles only shine brighter. If the swordsmanship of the Iviliano clan was like a cunning snake, then the rank handles were an indestructible rhinoceros. Even if his horn breaks, he will never stop his headbutt. Rank handles swordsmanship specialized in confronting enemies stronger. The problem was that because the rank handles were often too strong and rarely faced opponents who were superior to them, they could not make full use of their fighting style. Jin's blade still stood strong and fierce. In fact, his movements were slowly changing from defensive to offensive. His senses sharpened, and the trajectory of the blade became bolder. Vishkul's sword struck Jin in the chest. But the boy took another step forward, as if he was risking his life to aim at the opponent's neck. The attack Jin launched in exchange for the wound on his chest went down the drain. The boy let out a low groan, as the deep wound interfered with his movements, unlike the small wounds on his shoulder and hip. Fortunately, his bones and organs remained intact. Jin was breathing heavily. Obviously, Vishkul is not beating at full strength, but Jin was quite pleased with himself. He managed to fight with dignity against an opponent with a rank above the seventh, while he was only at the fifth rank. His vision was starting to become increasingly blurry and dim, but for some reason, he still felt that he could read and predict Vishkul's next move. Jin has lost too much blood. He slowly decided to bring this duel to an end. As his vision darkened, Jin finally realized the purpose of his training with the moon and began to understand the principle behind the heart sword exercise. The boy's position has changed. Jin closed his eyes and held the sword with his hand in front of his chest. It was almost like the pose of knights during a wedding ceremony. Or something like that. To show respect to young master Jin, Vishkul finally wrapped his sword with an aura for the first time during the battle. His intention was to break Jin's blade and end the duel. He thought it was the right way to finish the job, respecting the spirit and perseverance of the boy. He said it was a good fight. Vishkul gave his all in this last attack and threw himself at Jin. His blade was covered with the powerful aura of a knight of the eighth rank. It cut through the air and flew horizontally. Jin's sword, standing upright in his hands, shattered almost simultaneously with Vishkul's last blow. The secret technique of the Iviliano clan smashed the sword and reached for Jin's neck, but froze right before touching the boy's skin. If Vishkul hadn't stopped his weapon in time, it would definitely have decapitated his target. Jin remained standing for about two seconds before falling unconscious to the ground. As soon as the host announced the results of the fight, a medical team ran onto the stage. Vishkul thought about it. What the hell was that at the end? Vishkul undoubtedly destroyed Jin's sword. However, at the moment when the blade broke, Vishkul felt something sharp graze his throat. It would have been the end of the duel if Vishkul's last attack landed 0.1 seconds slower. The instincts of a knight of the 8th rank told him this. If Jin had reacted 0.1 seconds faster, Vishkul would have been carried off the stage mortally injured. A sword standing upright in front of Jin's face would have pierced him below the chin. Moreover, since Jin was already in a semi-conscious state during their last exchange, the boy would not have been able to stop his attack in time to save Vishkul's life. Needless to say, the ability to close this gap in 0.1 seconds makes a person a real master and expert. Jin rank Kendall, what a terrifying kid. Such thoughts were spinning in Vishkul's head. Jin couldn't breathe. He could only let out soft moans when he was choking. When he frantically opened his eyes, he saw the reason for this. A small black cat was sleeping on Jin's face. Indeed, it was Murakan. It had been lying on Jin's face for more than 30 minutes. Jin slowly stood up and stretched out his hands, taking Murakan by the scruff of the neck. The sun's rays penetrated through the window and illuminated his room. His whole body was as light as a feather. The wound on his chest and the abrasions all over his body completely disappeared. The medic probably healed Jin while he was unconscious. Jilly sensed his awakening and went to the bed with a cup of cold water. It was from her that he learned that he had slept for two whole days. Jin sighed. The banquet was over. It looks like he couldn't even greet the guests who had come to meet him. Jilly said there was no need to worry so much. She said that in the last two days everyone had been hotly discussing him with Vishkul. 
and this in itself is a confession, and all because Jin showed the sword of the heart. The fact that he was able to do this at the end of a duel with a knight of the 8th rank was truly impressive. Jin thought about it. It wasn't a perfect heart sword, but he got what he wanted. The days when he was mentored by the moon are finally paying off. At first, Jin didn't understand the essence of training at all, but they really helped him. Jin remembered how the moon kept repeating use your heart to observe like some kind of religious chant, and chuckled to himself. For the first time, he realized what a feeling the heart sword produced during his training with pure stones. After that, he tried to recreate this feeling again, but to no avail, which upset Jin. It seems that his heart sword is still at the level when it is activated only in an extreme situation that threatens his life. It's a pity, but Jin couldn't do anything about it. It was already impressive that he somehow managed to imitate the sword of the heart, albeit carelessly. In fact, the sword of the heart was a realm accessible only to true masters, starting from the 8th rank. Besides, Jin got enough buns, confirmed Veridin's status, and he found a kind of friendship with the heiress of the Ice Palace. I also found out that Buber Gaston and Vishkal Iveliano know each other. It is very likely that the Iveliano family or Vishkal are behind the crimes of transformation. It is also possible that Vishkal was part of some organization not part of his family, and Buber Gaston is associated with them. Jin thought about many possibilities, but he couldn't jump to conclusions. He had to investigate them and unravel the truth himself. After Jin's thoughts came to an end, Jilly pointed to a certain vase by the bed. There were pure white flowers with a soft shape like a snowflake, faintly glowing. Gilly said that the flowers were left by the heiress of the Ice Palace. Did she really like the young master? No, Jin explained that in the language of the Ice Palace, these flowers meant endless duel. He smiled. It looks like Ceres wanted to fight him again. Nurakin said that this was the first time Jin had received flowers from a girl. Although it's a challenge, it's still a memorable moment. He asked if his strawberry pie agreed with him. Nurakin grinned and looked at Gilly. He was careful with her because of the incident when he snuck into the banquet hall without her permission. Indeed, for the second day in a row, Jilly behaved as if Murakin did not exist. The cat's ears drooped. Ignoring Murakin, she informed Jin that the head of the family had told her to come to him as soon as he regained consciousness. It's time to prove your worth. A test to prove his worth for becoming a flag bearer. Although he had expected this, Jin felt a bit conflicted now that his father's instruction had arrived. Jin couldn't even dream of this day in his past life, but now it was right in front of him, within his reach. It looks like he will be living away from his family for a while. When Jin's siblings received the same invitation from their father, they all put on neat ceremonial clothes and combed their hair before going to him. Nevertheless, Jin lazily tidied up his disheveled hair and put on high-quality leather travel clothes. He also wore a bradamante around his waist before going out into the hallway. The Mausoleum Inside the mausoleum, on the lowest underground floor, there was not a single spot of light. The darkness smelled of metal, and Shiron's deep voice rang out. It had been a long time since his children had visited him in such comfortable clothes. Shiron asked Jin if he knew he was sending him away. Jin replied that he planned to hit the road today. Shiron really liked this side of his youngest son. The boy was not afraid of him and just clearly stated his intentions. His other children could not even imagine that they would behave like this in front of their father. They struggled to hide their fear and anxiety just by being in his presence. Jin knew about his father's character, so he specially came in casual clothes. He wasn't sure, but after rebirth, he began to read his father with ease. The father and son duo didn't talk for a while. However, it wasn't an awkward silence. Shiron was the first to break the silence by asking if Jin knew where they were. Yes, this is a mausoleum, a place where only those who have done worthy deeds in the name of the family are allowed to enter through the Garden of Swords. Great heroes are buried here. In other words, it is the last refuge of those who have protected the family for thousands of years. The first head of Temur Rankhandle was not here. As soon as Temur's name left Shiron's lips, Jin had a premonition that his father would raise the topic of Soldereth. He was confident in his intuition. Shiron said that Jin's dark power was the reason why they couldn't pay homage to the first patriarch. After his death, the Rankhandles made a humiliating pact with the Zipples, a pact forbidding swordsmen to use magic. Moreover, they were forbidden to worship ancestors who used magic. This was the true reason for the relegation of the Rankhandle family, a unique family of magical swordsmen, to a simple family of knights. It was an inevitable fate, as Soldrit was no longer around to protect the Rankhandles from the Zippel gods. As a result of the treaty, the Zippel gods joined forces and put a curse on the Rankhandle bloodline. Thus, every Rankhandle after Temur was born with a body that could not control mana. When Jin defeated the Tong brothers with his aura, Shiron did not ask how he gained this power. Then Jin lied that he would use this power for the benefit of the family. Fortunately, Jin was small then, but if it happened now, then Shiron would not have left everything so simple. Shiron asked a question. Had Jin heard Soldred's voice? Jin nodded, saying that Soldred had called him a contractor. Needless to say, 
Jin has not yet heard Solderit's voice since his rebirth. But there was no longer any need to hide from Shiren who he was. Shiren asked another question again. Didn't Jin think it was somehow unfair to his brothers and sisters? Can he use this power to surpass them and take care of the family? Jin has already come up with an answer to this question. He replied that he would leave and see the world. If there is nothing more valuable than Rank Handle, then he is in business. Jin also predicted that this answer would greatly satisfy his father. It goes without saying that Shiren was smiling, showing his beautiful and even teeth. Others left the Garden of Swords for someone else's recognition, but Jin left to see if the family was worthy of his recognition. Shiren didn't know if he should say that he was proud of him or that Jin was arrogant. He held out his hand, showing five fingers. Shiren gave Jin five years. During this time, he must achieve recognition or recognize the family and return with an answer. There was no need to prolong the conversation. Jin unsheathed his Bradamante and raised his sword. He thanked his father for everything. He will greet him in five years. Jin came out of the mausoleum. Jilly had already finished her preparations for departure and was waiting for him with a suitcase in her hands. Jilly had metal nails piercing her wrist. When Jin's gaze reached these anomalies, Jilly straightened her clothes and hid the oddities. The nails were medical instruments used to seal Gilly's aura. She won't be able to use the energy until Jin's qualifications as a standard bearer are proven. Jilly laughed awkwardly, which made Jean feel a suffocating throb in his chest. It was a family tradition. The rank handles sealed the Nana's powers so that the trainee flag bearers could not get their help in gaining reputation and honor. If they ever remove the seal without the family's permission, the nanny will be mercilessly crippled. She asked Jin not to make that face. When you're a babysitter, you don't earn a reputation for yourself. It's based on the achievement of your master, so there was no need to make such a face. Jin promised that he would protect her for five years. He also apologized for that. Jilly closed her eyes and smiled. It was enough for her that she could be near Jin. She would still regain her powers when he completed his test. After taking a last look at the Garden of Swords, they left this place. This is just the beginning of his journey. Jin wanted to see the world. Shiren, who remained in the mausoleum, quietly thought to himself, Will his youngest son get the power to free the rank handles from the zipples? He couldn't wait to see it with his own eyes. Even though Shiren had reached the demigod realm by wielding a single sword, he still couldn't break the pact made by his ancestors. The only hope of the rank handle family was Solder its contractor, his youngest son. Of course, at the moment, this hope was just a candle in the wind. One day passed. Two people were walking along a path in the forest. Jin used his fire magic to light the way in the night. Jilly asked if it was normal that they left without saying goodbye. The cadets under his command and Lady Luna will be disappointed. Jin said not to worry. After all, the moon itself is freedom-loving. And the cadets, he wasn't going to die. If he had warned them, they would surely have arranged a send-off with their swords raised. No, he was sure it would be. Jilly asked where they were going. From what she had heard, most of the flag bearers went to Mammoth first, because destroying evil is the most effective way to earn fame. Rank handles replacement flag bearers. Before becoming full-fledged flag bearers, they must go to the outside world and create a reputation for themselves from scratch. In addition, independence is one of the mandatory conditions. No support from the family. For example, his sister Mary defeated all the strongest people in the southern regions of the continent and became recognizable as the Fury of the Southern Land's Furious Wind even before being ordained as a standard bear. Other siblings were absent from six months to two years. However, Shiren gave Jin all five years. There is only one reason for this. He must learn everything about the energy of shadows. Jin replied to Gilly that they would go to the Kingdom of Arkan. Jilly was worried. This was Zippel territory. The Kingdom of Arkan is a nation that is affiliated with the Lutero Federation of Magicians. Jin said that when he was on a mission in the ruins of Colin, he heard that a large number of unregistered magicians were rampant in the area. As the name implies, unregistered magicians are magicians who have not registered their name with the Association of Magicians. Most of them are either criminals or evil mercenaries. They teamed up with martial artists and caused a lot of trouble to the locals of Arkan. Jilly said it was a great idea. Jilly said, shaking her fist, that she was happy to get rid of bad guys when she was on duty. It goes without saying that Jin didn't hear any of this in the ruins of Colin. It was just information he knew from his past life. Anyone who has been to the Arkan Kingdom knows that unregistered mages and mercenaries are wreaking havoc. A small number of unregistered magicians and mercenaries in Arkan were pawns and henchmen of the Dark Tessing family. Jin's real business was related to this family. In the underground auction house that housed the Tessings, there were countless items whose true value was not yet known to the whole world. He has a couple of grimoires and a ring in mind. However, there was one big problem. Jilly informed them that they would not be able to use the teleportation gate to get to the Arkan Kingdom. 
following the rules of the family. She was only able to take 10 gold coins with her. As a backup flag bearer, Jin was forbidden to reveal his rank handle affiliation, so the choice of transport was scarce. The trio went broke. In the Garden of Swords, none of them needed to worry about money, but right now they only had 10 gold coins in their pockets. Jin said he would sort it out when they got to the Jin Kingdom. The Jin Kingdom. But how will they get there? Gilly was interested in that. Jin replied that they would just fly. He told Mirakin to transform. Gilly tried to talk him out of it. What happens if someone finds out? Mirakin jumped off Gilly's shoulder and has already returned to his black dragon form. He said to hold on tight. We'll have to fly at all costs to get to the Jin Kingdom by tomorrow. Walking down the corridor, Luna felt a strong energy. Turning her head, she saw Murekin flying through the sky, as well as two people on his back. Her beloved younger brother rode the dragon when he became a backup standard bear. She smiled. Jean was very special. He rushed off without even saying goodbye to her. Luna wished good luck to her cold little brother. The trio arrived in the Jin Kingdom. Unfortunately, Gilly's condition was bad. As soon as they landed on a hill in the vicinity of the capital of the Jin Kingdom, Jilly got off the Murekin and began to vomit. Murakin started blaming Jin for this. Jin replied that he had nothing to do with it. It's just that someone doesn't know how to drive. Murakin comforted Gilly for a while, patting her on the back. She was still trembling all over with a face as pale as a ghost. Murakin took advantage of this opportunity and hugged Jilly tightly. Whether she knew of his intentions or not, Jilly didn't resist. Then Murakin talked a lot while looking at Jin. He said he would look after Jilly and let Jin go and find them money. Jin decided to follow Murakin's suggestion. The center of the capital of the Jin Kingdom, the Villa Family Mansion. Fortunately, Samber was sitting in the center of the lake in the residence and looked pathetic. That way, Jin didn't have to deal with other guards and wreak havoc. Despite the grandiosity of the banquet in honor of Jin, Samber found out about everything only after the end. Even if it was a mission, Jin saved his life. Samber wanted to meet him again and thank him for saving him. At that moment, Samber appeared and covered his mouth with his hand. Samber tried to scream out of surprise. Recognizing his savior, Sember calmed down. Jin didn't say many words. He asked Sember to give him some gold and cash. Flag bearers are required to hide their identity. These are the rules. They should earn a reputation only on their own, without the help of their family. Most of Rankhandle's temporary flag bearers spend their first two months in poverty. They have been learning how to strike, stab and chop enemies since they were born into this family of swordsmen. Thus, their feelings and intuition in the economy were absent. They have never earned money themselves, so it is not surprising that, once in the real world, they will spend a couple of months without money. Therefore, most of the temporary flag bearers either killed criminal authorities in Mamita and brought their heads to the investigation group of Bement, or lived as mercenaries to earn money. But until then, they would be penniless. But Jin was different from them. Today was Jin's third day as a temporary flag bearer. The boy, his babysitter and the dragon were eating all the food in the best and most popular restaurant of the Jin kingdom. Although they ordered dozens of dishes, the bill barely touched their funds. Jilly was incredibly pretty. She didn't expect that the food in the Jin Kingdom would be so delicious. To be honest, she was preparing for frequent stops like the other flag bearers did. But thanks to Jin, they got there in the blink of an eye. Murekin burst out laughing. Yesterday she said, Isn't this extortion, young master? Jilly didn't know what to say. Jin replied that everything was fair. Having helped with the money, Sember was able to repay his debt. Looking at Murakin's stomach, he asked if it was a girl or a boy. They will have to pass the teleportation gate. What will Murakin do if he throws up again? Murakin told him to be silent. He's a glutton. To eat to the brim is sacred, even if it starts to turn out. Murakin seemed to be himself. If it wasn't for Jin, Murakin would have to starve for the next few days. Jin told him not to talk about gluttony as if there was something to be proud of. Murakin replied that if Jin didn't want to watch him empty his stomach, then they could fly. Only Jin insisted on teleporting. Jilly's seasickness wasn't the main problem. They were on their way to the Kingdom of Arkin. This place was affiliated with the Lutero Magicians Federation, which is run by the Zippel family. Currently, 80% of active dragons cooperate with Zippels, so if they carelessly fly in there, it would be tantamount to a declaration of war. Murakin turned into a cat again. He said that more than half of these dragons would shit their pants after hearing just one of his names. Scoundrels hold their heads high. The world has become such a wonderful place during his absence. Dragons, gods who are indebted to dragons, and dozens of contractors associated with these gods support the Zippel family, and they all waited patiently for Shiren's death. On the one hand, Jin is the only one of the rank handles who has signed a contract with God. When Shiren disappears, the Zippels can easily destroy the rank handles who have been a thorn in their side. Stop, Jin thought about it. How did the Zippels manage to assemble a table of contractors, and even in one generation? 
it was hard to call it a coincidence. The trio headed to the teleportation gate of the Jin Kingdom, where they completed the legal procedures. Nurekin didn't have an ID, so he turned into a cat to travel with Jin and Jilly. As soon as they took their seats in the quiet waiting room, an employee made an announcement. Jilly was impressed by the identification cards made by the family. They didn't have a single problem. They were sophisticated enough to deceive even the special affairs department of the Bement Empire. Bright blue mana gently enveloped the three of them, and after a while they opened their eyes in the Kingdom of Arkin. Jin spent a year in the capital of the Kingdom of Arkin right before his rebirth. Although there was a 15-year gap between the current city and the city from Jin's memories, the view didn't change much. Street vendors, homeless people lurking on the ground next to them, people from the dark alleys of the city, etc. The shadows on people's faces contrasted sharply with the clean roads and bright sunlight. Indeed, the city was warm all year round. Jilly also noticed the discrepancy and was wary of their surroundings. The city was too gloomy, despite the good weather. Jin assumed it was the looters. He heard that it was especially bad at this time. He offered to stay first, and only after to find the victim. In truth, Jin had already chosen a hotel, as well as their first target. Standing in front of an old and dirty hotel, Murakin turned to Jin with displeasure. Was he seriously going to stay in this godforsaken barn? Jilly supposed Jin must have had a plan. Murakin was not convinced. Jin was rich now, so does it make sense for them to stay here? Jin did not plan to show himself as a regressor to Gilly and Murakin in the future. Thus, Jin needed good excuses to convince them whenever he made plans using his knowledge from his past life. Just like now, he asked if it was a good idea for a bunch of unregistered magicians to come to such an environment and show that they have a lot of money. But even so, Murakin was not convinced. Why should they stop where even orcs wouldn't go? Jin came up with some excuse and led them to the hotel. One thin man was sitting behind the counter with his head on a hard table, and his drool formed a puddle. He didn't feel the presence of the trio and just snored loudly when the smell of alcohol filled the air. He shifted his position uncertainly and quickly examined the three guests from head to toe. Then he immediately marked them for fools that he could fool. A gigolo, a swordsman on his first journey and a woman. Well, she's pretty pretty. The maid. Obviously, this is a young and stupid aristocrat with his servants playing adventurers. Despite such thoughts running through his head, he was just smiling brightly from the outside. His name was Jet, and this was his hotel. He offered the trio a special orange juice. Jet made his decision as soon as he saw the trio. He will drug them with sleeping pills and sell them as slaves at an underground auction tessing. Quick mind and quick execution of their plans. The blessed bodies of the rank handles have little resistance to most poisons. So these cheap sleeping pills are unlikely to work on the genie. Jin thought for a moment. Should he drink a cup and tell him that the sleeping pills were delicious while beating up a man? Or should he tell Jet to try the drink first? However, there was one option that Jin completely overlooked. Nurakin wasn't in a good mood for a while. The dragon looked at the bubbles floating in the orange juice with spikes. Nurakin in a rage threw a glass of juice in Jet's face, and then kicked him in the face. Nurakin couldn't help but be angry. How did this insignificant worm try to poison him? Jilly stared at the glass of orange juice in a daze. Jin just poured the juice on the floor. The tyrannical aura of the shadow dragon broke free, which terrified Jet. Nurakin threatened to kill him, saying that he would die today. Luckily for him, Jet was quick-witted and adaptable. He did not hesitate to change his behavior, as he was very attached to his life. The best plan now was to immediately kneel down, admit his wrongdoing, and beg for mercy. Needless to say, Murakin didn't give Jet time to apologize and continued the barrage of attacks. The dragon in human form spat out all kinds of insults to the tavern owner. Jet is a self-proclaimed high-class informant, the one to whom Jin owed a debt in a previous life. Thanks to his help, Jean, who was expelled from his family and had no foundation, was able to settle here in Arkin. Over time, he and Jet became closer, but it didn't lead to anything good. Under the pretext of getting to know the underground auction houses of Tessing, he deceived Jin countless times and took everything except clothes. Just thinking about it made Jin mad. However, this time Jin was going to use Jet to the fullest. Jet threatened Murakin, saying that he was of the fifth rank. But who cared? Murakin just started hitting him harder. Seeing Jet, with whom Jin had a terrible relationship in his past life, get beaten up gave him a whole new sense of satisfaction. However, a scammer would be quite useful. If this continues, Jet will soon turn into a cold corpse. Jin stopped Murakin. He wanted to hear what Jet had to say to them. Murakin stopped beating and turned to Jin. Why should they listen to an idiot who tried to poison them? Murakin was still angry, seeing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Jet immediately began begging for mercy from Jin. Despite his broken ribs and flattened nose, Jet spoke clearly and articulately. His tenacity and will to survive were admired. Jin sat down and said he would ask a couple of simple questions. If Jet lies, he will die. If he tells the truth, he will live. 
Jin warned that he would judge Jet's answers subjectively based on his feelings and instincts. So Jin asked his first question. What did Jet do? Normally, the first question that could be asked would be something like did you really poison our drinks? Or why did you put poison in us? However, Jin's interrogation started with a more advanced question. So Jet realized that Jin is not an ordinary child. He knew that it was useless to try to win Jin's sympathy, so all he could do was reveal the truth as objectively as possible. He started with his name. Jet was a hotelier and an informant. He also said that he is a fraudster and a human trafficker. From Jet's to-do list, Murakin and Gilly's faces contorted. Jet crawled to Jin's feet in the blink of an eye. Jet said that if Jin spared him, he would be very useful to him. He knew all about Arkin. Jin asked the second question. It looks like he was trying to get them drunk in order to sell them somewhere. Where did he want to sell them? Everything was like that. Jet quickly confessed, lowering his head even lower. Jin stepped on Jet's hand. Jet screamed in pain, quickly calling the name Tessing. The underground auction house of Tessing. Jin pressed harder, asking for details. Tessing is a dark organization that runs auction houses. There are slaves, Elystian poisons, stolen treasures, and even artifacts. In other words, a place where everything is. Jin removed his foot. He said that by the evening he would ask someone to heal him. Jin also asked a question about whether Jet knew what to do next. Jet understood everything and thanked Jin for his mercy. Jet will be useful to them during their stay in the kingdom of Arkin. Although Jin hated Jet and his very existence, he still highly valued the skills and knowledge of this scum. Murakin asked why Jin was going to spend money on medical bills for such scum. Jilly agreed with Murakin. If they spare Jet, he will try to deceive them again. A dark organization in an underground auction house. Jin asked if there was anything better than destroying them. It will never be too late to get rid of Jet. He said they would trust him. They still need an Arkin guide. But first you need to find someone who will take care of Jet. The babysitter and the dragon didn't argue anymore and agreed to the boy's plan. In order for the journey to go smoothly and without complications, sometimes it was necessary to agree with the decisions of the leader. Nurakin and Gilly stayed at the hotel to look after Jet, while Jin left to find someone to cure the crook. Jin really considered the two of them good friends. However, as soon as the boy took a step outside the hotel, he felt an unprecedented sense of freedom. Now he could use his knowledge as a regressor as much as he wanted. Jet was cured in the evening. It was a mage from the Luthero Federation. He turned out to be a skilled healer. It was a magician that Jin met by chance. Jet, meanwhile, was looking at his new teeth. This crazy trio was first beaten, and then cured. He couldn't help but think about who they were. The man who beat him up was an extremely experienced fighter. The maid seemed used to seeing violent scenes. Finally, the boy Jet thought was a young and stupid aristocrat naturally commanded the other two as if they were his vassals. It was a sight Jet had never seen before. Was the boy the heir of a martial arts family? Or are they from the special affairs department of the Bement Empire? Anyway, there will be nothing left of him if he decides to stab them in the back. At that moment, Jin came over. It was time to move out. They need to go to an underground auction house. The place where they arrived looked at first glance like an ordinary aristocratic villa. However, it was actually a place where all kinds of illegal operations took place. The guards greeted Jet. They asked if the trio was behind him. Jet told them to stop talking nonsense. These people are his guests. Then, the three of them followed Jet into the auction house. Despite the fact that they were run by small street bandits, the nobles of Arkin held parties in the courtyard. As soon as they entered, the chatter stopped, and the air was filled with the pleasant melody of a violin. A group of musicians in tuxedos constantly played for the public. Jet brought the masks and distributed them to the trio. If they wanted to go to the auction house, it was better to hide their faces. Although everyone knows that the boss of Tessing is called Salka, the real puppeteer is someone else. The real boss was someone called a Luck Spider-Man. Everything here was decorated to his taste. Because he wants to hide his uncouth and uneducated by all means. For a small fry like Jet, it's different. Not only does Allah have the ability to pacify these dirty streets, he was also a 7th rank martial artist from the lands of Arable. It was rumored that he had connections with a family of pure-blooded Rankhandles across the sea. Rankhandle, Jin was interested. Murakin told him to just ignore it. Rankhandles do not communicate with scumbags from the very bottom of the neighboring state. Gilly supported Murakin's words. She said there was no one matching the description. No, there is one. The bastard who put a curse on Jin that made him unable to wield a sword. If there is a connection with the Federation of Magic, then it is very likely that it is him. The curse of the ninth rank, hindering the use of the sword, the illusion of the blade. Jin didn't think there was a magician in Tessing who could cast such a complex spell. However, Jin couldn't do anything but grab at straws. He spent ten years in the Tempest Castle and five in the Garden of Swords. All this time he was looking for the culprit of the curse, but could not find a single clue or trace. Okay, they came to lift this place up in the air. 
As a nice bonus, they will learn the identity of this Aluk. Murekin asked about their plan. Something in the spirit of destroy all gangsters on the first day of arrival in Arkin. Jilly whispered that the guards they saw along the way were pleased with the strong ones. There were also many unregistered magicians nearby. A sudden fight in the middle of enemy territory is a bit of a bad idea. Jin told them not to worry about it. He had it all figured out. He called Gilly and Murakin to him. Jin told them his plan. Murakin sometimes couldn't understand what was in Jin's head at all. How does he even come to such things? Even Jilly was a little shocked. Jin's plan was definitely unusual. But, was Jin sure about this plan? Jin told them not to worry, because they could always run away. They finally arrived at the Flower of Tessing, an underground auction house. Jet deliberately took a seat that was not too conspicuous. After talking to himself for a while, the auctioneer finally came on stage. At the same time, a dozen slaves in rags joined him. At least there were no children. Jet also tried to sell them. He apologized again. Jin was glad he hadn't seen any children among the slaves. Murekin was somewhat annoyed when he asked about the plans. Jin told him that they would be waiting. He had heard that sometimes curious things slip through at these auctions. If there is such a thing, first he will buy, and then he will make a move. There was one artifact that Jin wanted to take for himself. If his memory did not fail him, this ring was rotting somewhere in the vault. He will be able to get it only after their plan is implemented. A week later, the auction started again. Jet asked Jin to buy something. Otherwise, the people from Tessing could cause him problems. Jin wasn't going to buy something just for the sake of it. Preventing problems was Jet's job. Jet could only agree, but inside, he cursed Jin for it. Soon, the slave auction ended, and when the books and artifacts appeared on the scene, the first point, the grimoire of the magician who once ruled the world, the magical grimoire of Matthew Wanick. They haven't deciphered it, but there must be some incredible spells written on it. After that, the bets immediately flew. Jin grinned. The auctioneer made a mistake when placing the lot. The correct name was Matthew Mornick. And, as Jin remembered, his grimoires were already under the control of the Zipples. This meant that the chance of originality of this lot is zero. Weekly auctions have always been like this. The auctioneer spat some nonsense, then greedy wizards made stupid bets. The next lot. The author of this grimoire was Chenmi. The initial bid is 50 gold. The auction house was quiet. Even Jin didn't know that name. Sometimes such grimoires were exhibited. Such a grimoire is a gambling game. And it is extremely rare to win in such a game. In his opinion, there was no need to buy such a grimoire. However, Murekin thought otherwise. He told Jin to buy this grimoire. If this grimoire belonged to the Chenmi he knew, then they needed this grimoire. Dragon's advice is a strong recommendation. Jin had no reason to doubt his words, so he raised his hand. 150 gold pieces. That's how much Jin offered. For an ancient, magical grimoire, the price was neither too high nor too low. However, the other guests thought Jin had gone crazy. There were also wizards who were curious. After all, the guy who hadn't bought anything in the last week just bet on a magic grimoire. Chenmi's grimoire was soon sold to Jin. Murakin had a serious expression on his face. He wondered, why was Chenmi's grimoire in a place like this? There was another lot that intrigued Jin. It was Shujil Easter's grimoire. Easter, the name that Jin noticed when he first walked into a bar in Mamet. As soon as he heard that name, he doubted his own ears. Easter was the family of Jin's teacher, but it was also a family that was destroyed hundreds of years ago. Jin bet as much as 200 gold pieces. As before, the crowd began to whisper after Jin announced his first bet. At first they thought he was special, but now they thought he was an idiot haggling for shit. Nurekin asked if he was familiar with this grimoire. Jin replied that he bought it for nothing. I thought it would be nice to buy something else. The grimoire was quickly sold. Jin decided that he would give the grimoire to his master as soon as he met him. That was enough. Jin decided to make his move now. The purchased grimoires have arrived. Nurakin made sure that Chenmi's grimoire was genuine. When he opened Easter's grimoire, he couldn't understand a word. There was a bizarre and strange code. This strange and complex encryption system was known only by two people, Jin and his teacher. And since Jin learned about it from his mentor, Shujil Easter was his ancestor. Jet happily stood by. Jin finally bought something, and now they won't get kicked out. Jin turned to Jet. He wanted to meet with a luck. Jet usually said he understood. However, this time his expression changed. He said it was impossible. Jean leaned over and told him in his ear to tell Aluk that Veridine Zippel wanted to meet him. It seemed that Jet's eyes would pop out of their sockets. This crazy bastard wasn't from the special affairs department of Bement. He was a purebred Zippel. Five minutes ago, Jet's main goal was to become an informant for the alleged special affairs department of the Bement Empire. Then he could have saved his life and received a reward greater than from Tessing. What about becoming a servant of the Zippels? There is no greater honor for a member of the Lutero Magic Federation than to serve the Zippels. He already imagined how he would leave this hole. His future life will be easy and free. Jet quickly walked past several employees and opened the door. 
Jet shouted for Luck to come out. Farad and Zippel is here. He was met by hostile bullies. Soon they came to Jin in a crowd. Next to them was a battered Jet. The big guy told Jin that his boss wanted to see him. In a split second, Jin hit him and attracted the attention of the entire room. In his left hand, Jin created a crimson sphere of flame. He asked if he was a fool. He wasn't, Jin asked, despite the fact that he knew Luck's face. The big guy looked confused, but he couldn't fight back or anything like that. Jin said that they revealed their name, but Aluk dared to send his pawns to him. Jin told Aluk to crawl on all fours right at his feet. Five minutes have passed. Aluk really crawled up to Jin. A rather large middle-aged man crawling on the floor was not the most pleasant sight. As for Aluk, millions of thoughts raced through his head. He had a herd of his subordinates with him. The other agents, who were standing awkwardly, quickly dropped to the ground. If the situation had continued as it is, the rest of the work would have been a piece of cake. After scaring Aluk, they could inspect the vault and pick up the artifact. However, Aluk was not a simple man. If he ever saw an opportunity, he would break out and kill all three of them. Jin stood there as if he was used to acting like a boss. Frankly speaking, he behaved the same way as at home. Aluk asked for forgiveness. He made the mistake of not recognizing him, the Lord of Heaven. The battered jet was grinning. If someone claimed to be Varid in Zippel, he would have laughed in his face, but Jean was different. His aura is different. Before that, he used a fireball. And this is at least rank 5 mana. Being fluent in rank 5 mana at that age would be difficult for others, but not for Zippel. A week ago, Jean's plan was to pretend to be Varid in Zippel. Even if this Aluk knows someone who is familiar with Zippels, it is unlikely that this someone is above the status of an old servant. Aluk will not be able to prove that Jin is not Veridin. Jilly was worried. If in the future this becomes known to the family or, fate forbid, to the patriarch, then he will not turn into problems. Jin ordered Aluk to get up. The man was more than two meters tall. Meeting with Aluk created the feeling that he was standing in front of a wall. However, the head of the teasing clan was constantly looking down, never meeting Jin's eyes. It was an obvious reaction after meeting the supposed purebred Zippel. Jin showed two recently purchased grimoires. Aluk lowered his head when he saw the magical manuscripts. He apologized for requesting the magical manuscripts without Zippel's permission. Jin stated that these manuscripts were highly valued by his family. How much money did Aluk earn on this? Aluk said that it might seem like a pathetic excuse, but he is a master of martial arts. He was stupid enough not to be able to determine the value of these texts and inconvenienced him. He will do everything possible to get them back. Aluk only asked to give him another chance. Jin patted Aluk's chest with magical manuscripts. He said it would be easier to get them back himself than to rely on a guy like him. Jin told him to shut up and bring him a list of auctioneers and a ledger. Starting tomorrow, the Zippel family will launch an investigation. When Jin skillfully lied, Aluk realized that he had nothing to say. That was the end. No matter how hard they try, unlike the Zippels, they are just a small local gang. If something comes up during the investigation that the magicians will not like, then Tessing will come to an end. Jin was reading notes in Aluk's office. Aluk said that this was almost all that was at the auction. Jin asked if there were any more recordings. Yes, but in a strictly guarded vault. But it was located in a residence for workers. If Jin allows him to temporarily leave, Aluk will deliver them right away. It will take a couple of hours, so Jin will have to wait. Jin looked at him and said, what kind of bullshit was he trying to pull off? Was he really going to get away and destroy important documents, and then check if he was a real Veridin and why he came, asking the guys he bribed? Aluk knew that his plan was obvious, but he had to take a chance. He trembled with anger and shame. Jin told him to spin around as much as he wanted, but let him not forget that he was still sitting on his hook. Aluk bit his lips in rage and turned away. He said he would be back soon and asked his people to show Jin the vault in his absence. As he left, Aluk whispered to his subordinate to keep Jin in the mansion until his return. With a serious expression on his face, Aluk headed for the exit of the auction house. Only Teasing's agents remained inside, as well as Jin and his comrades. Quick-witted agents approached Jin and immediately escorted him to the warehouse. Aluk was seething with anger. Does the arrogant bastard Veridin think that everything obeys him? Damn it. He spent a huge amount of money on Zippels. Aluk decided that he would find a way to buy them back. The trio scattered everything in the vault. Everyone was looking for something valuable. Jilly asked if everything was okay. Murakin replied that everything was stolen anyway. The dragon threw out all the things, saying that there was only trash here. One of the grimoires fell on the head of the Aluk man. He turned to Jin. It was about this oaf. He'll know for sure that Jin lied to him when he gets back. What was Jin going to do then? Jin calmly replied that they were just buying at a 100% discount and running away before Aluha returned. Jin opened the small chest and found the artifact he had come for. It was a low-quality silver ring. Jilly asked if they would continue to throw themselves into the pool with their heads. She couldn't get over the shock. Jin chuckled. 
He took it as a compliment. Jet came running with a stack of papers. These were the slave papers that Jin had requested. Jet recorded everything, from the region of birth to age. Jin praised him. Jet has done a really good job in such a short time. Jin said they were done here. The guard blocked his way, saying that his boss would be back soon and would bring the account books. Until then, he should stay in the mansion. Jin knocked him out with one punch to the jaw. Jet was shocked by this. He started praising Jin. Not only a powerful magician, but also a great fighter. Inside, he was feverishly thinking why Veridin had knocked out the subordinate Aluk. Suddenly, Jin asked Jet if he had a family. Yes, Jet had a young son. Jin told me to grab him and run. And it's better to run to the Bement Empire. Jet was stunned. He thought that Veridin was abandoning him. Jin also told Jet to hand over the bills and introduce himself as an informant. That's the only way he can survive. Jet started saying that he would stay with him until the end. No, he won't give up so easily. He was busting his ass for this opportunity. Jet asked him in a righteous tone to let him serve Jin in his great deeds for the rest of his life. Jet wanted to succeed at something for once. Jin said he wasn't Veridine Zippel. For Jet, it had to be the eye-popping truth. Two hours later, Aluk came and saw an unconscious subordinate. There was no trace of Jin and the other two. Aluk had already realized that Jin was an imposter. He found out that Veridine Zippel has long silver hair. Aluk was informed that the imposters had taken information about slaves and other clients, and then ran away, saying that Tessing was over. The veins in Aluk's neck bulged with rage. Aluk was ready to explode. He took one of his subordinates by the head and slammed him into the wall. As much as he wanted to kill all his workers, catching the imposter was more important. Aluk ordered to take all those who remained, and the crooks will be returned. Aluk's face was distorted from overflowing negative feelings. He decided that he would personally skin them. Jin didn't leave Arkin. He and his companions were waiting for a luck on the outskirts of the kingdom. Murekin asked why they were idling. He didn't think they would get anything by fussing over the Salua. Jin needed to check if Allah had any connection with the rank handles. It was very important for young rank handle. Although Murekin didn't particularly like it, he decided to take it as a farewell before leaving. In the end, Aluk gave Jin a Chenmi grimoire and even gave him a masterpiece. Murekin almost went crazy when he saw this thing in Jin's hands at the auction exit. How did Jin even find out about something so old and was even able to find it? Some time later, a group of the Tessing family found the trio while they were sitting around a small fire. The employee started a signal firework. However, they could not openly attack three targets. The imposter was a child, but they remembered that he possessed at least rank 5 magic. It was a strange confrontation. Jin, who wasn't going to run away, was just waiting for Aluha, and they were waiting for reinforcements. The evil luck came running. He was wet with sweat. Behind him were about a hundred subordinates who were also panting from exhaustion. Aluk was finally able to catch up with the scammers. How dare they deceive him? Did they really dream that they could trick him and escape? Yes, he will hang them in the market for the edification of others. Aluk will show you what happens when you contact the head of Tessing, Aluk the Spider Armed, the register in which the names of the kidnapped slaves from Bement were recorded, the ledger of transactions with the ancient grimoire that the Zippel family is looking for as well as the customer register, which lists all the aristocrats who turned a blind eye to Tessing, Jin will spread it all over the world. Jin said that from tomorrow the world will be watching Aluk. Magic mail was incredibly convenient for this kind of thing. Jin was honest. Aluk was already finished. Aluk finally exploded with anger out of desperation. He said he wouldn't let Jin die easily. He'll skin him alive. Every time Jin loses consciousness, he will return it by burning it with flames. Jin turned to Murakin, saying that he wanted to fight Aluk one-on-one. -on -one. Murakin sighed. It's too much for Murakin, but he could only take on Aluk's people. Aluk in a rage ordered to attack Muarkin. Jin had to be kept alive and brought to him, and the others had to be killed. Of all the employees of Aluk, half were magicians, and the rest were mercenaries. The magicians began to conjure from afar, and the mercenaries began to shorten the distance. Unlike them, Murakin was practically naked. He was wearing only a thin shirt and bare arms. However, despite the lack of equipment, Murekin broke the jaw of the first attacker and rushed into the crowd of mercenaries. They weren't well trained, but they weren't unskilled either. In the middle of the crowd, every time Murekin struck, someone either died or fainted. In the eyes of Aluk and his bodyguards, Murekin looked like an invincible fighter. The mages couldn't attack. They just looked at it in fright. If they open fire, they will hit their comrades. Seeing this, Aluk ordered them to attack Jin and Gilly. The magicians changed their target after hearing the screech of the Aluk. Jin grinned at the incompetence. Jean told Jilly to stand here for a second. The mages raised their staffs at the same time. Ice icicles, fireballs and wind magic formed. It all went to Jean and Jilly. All this magic was below the fifth rank. Jin didn't even need to dodge these weak spells. Thanks to the Orgul Demon King's pendant, Jin was immune to any spells of the fifth rank and below. The spells scattered before they reached the genie. 
The spells of the unregistered Tessing mages were blocked in the blink of an eye. The magicians were stunned by what they saw. Jin thanked his sister Luna for the training. It was much easier after them. Jilly sighed and rebuked him. Jin didn't even say goodbye to her before he left. Mirakin is almost done with the mercenaries. It doesn't matter if there were fifty or a hundred of them, sixes or sixes. It was too easy for the Shadow Dragon. Five minutes have passed since the start of the fight. The fighters flew away like rag dolls. Tessing's mercenaries were losing the will to fight. But their crushing defeat from those was not only because Jin and his comrades were strong. After learning that Jin was an imposter, the elite forces of the Tessings fled. They predicted that Aluk is dead. Until now, the Zipples have not noticed the illegal activity of the Tessings. But after the imposter deceived them, they realized that the family would inevitably fall. It was clear that after sunrise, the Zipples would take action, so their escape was a wise decision. At that moment, Aluk realized that his underground empire would soon fall. Aluk smiled painfully as his sword emitted a white aura. He laughed like a madman. Aluk started chopping down his magicians. They failed to escape from their crazy boss, so most of them immediately died on the spot. Aluk killed each of his subordinates with a straight face, justifying the nickname. It seemed Aluk had gone crazy. It was even good for the Trinity. This will save them some hassle. Murakin has already dealt with the small fry, as Jin requested. Now Jin could do whatever he wanted. Aluk asked who sent them. He spoke with bloodshot eyes. Jin replied that it didn't matter. After all, he's going to die soon. The flash of light. Aluk swung his sword and hit the rock next to Jin. He was very fast. Aluk grinned. Right. How would he know if Jin was telling him the truth? He wasn't going to go to hell alone. They should also go with him and keep him company in hell. Mirakin giggled. Finally, Jin has found a worthy opponent with whom he can give his all. Rumors that Aluk was a martial artist of the seventh rank turned out to be true. Mirakin shouted that Aluk was different from Vishkul. Vishkul tried not to hurt him too much, but Aluk dreams of killing Jin. He needs to give his all and try not to die. Aluk thought Jin was a magician, probably because he demonstrated the magic of the fifth when he posed as Veridin Zippel. Aluk quickly closed the distance between them and swung his sword. However, his eyes widened when Jin retorted, so the imposter wasn't a magician. Bradamante was glowing with an aura. All Jin did was repel Aluk's attack, but it felt like his bones were rattling. Jin quickly retreated. As soon as he increased the gap, Aluk shortened the distance again. He could read all of Jin's movements. The next blows tore Jin's coat. Drops of blood flew into the air, but it wasn't a serious injury. Aluk was fast. He was not fighting at full strength, but even so it was difficult to cope with him. The fight went according to Aluk's plan. It's unbelievable that he was so strong. Jin barely had time to react to every attack. He was constantly thrown back. At that moment, Aluk thought that the child was a knight. To think that he was in such a situation because he fell for a primitive trick of Jin. Although he knew that his opponent was not Verid in Zippel, he controlled himself and attacked in cold blood. His enemy's rank was about fifth, but still he didn't know the opponent's trump cards. And yet, despite this knowledge, Aluk was not worried about Gina. He was more worried about Murakin, who was smiling as he watched them. Murakin single-handedly dealt with all his sixes. He was sure that Murakin was stronger than him. But why did he just stand there and watch? After killing dozens of people, Murakin simply stopped fighting. Aluk didn't know about the guy's intentions, but he wanted to think about it after killing Jin. Murakin, on the other hand, liked to watch the young Rankindle fight. Murakin grinned. The clash of Jin's and Aluk's swords was music to his ears. Jilly asked if Murakin was going to interfere. Of course, this is her young master's wish, but perhaps it's too early for him to stand up against a 7th rank sword master. She thought Jin would lose. As Jilly said, Jin was barely holding on. His dodges were accurate, but his movements were definitely getting slower. Murakin replied that everything was fine. Jin must realize the value of life. And does she really think Jin will lose? It was funny to watch the constant attacks on the boy, but Murakin already knew the outcome of the battle. A long time ago, when the rank handle swordsmen were still fighting, the difference of two ranks was nothing to them. A pillar of flame came out of Jin's hand. It was a fire spell of the fifth rank. This was the first time Aluk had retreated in battle. His eyes widened. If it's not an artifact, then his opponent must be a swordsman mage. A lightning spell followed. Jin cast the spell he used in that in, and lightning struck the place he chose, lighting up the night sky. Aluk felt the imminent blow and quickly moved away, throwing the body aside and repelled the lightning with his sword. At the moment when Jin was left unprotected, Aluk planned to shorten the distance and cut his throat. It was a great opportunity. For a split second, Aluk's legs were filled with energy. When he pushed off from the ground, an explosion rang out, leaving behind a funnel. His sword was aimed at Jin's neck. Whether it was a knife wound or decapitation, Aluk was sure that Jin would die. He would never have guessed that this whole situation was created by Jin himself. Normally, Aluk would have noticed this trick. He was of the seventh rank for a reason. However, he was desperate. 
Since this was his first fight with a magic swordsman, he decided to end it as soon as possible. After all, the longer the fight, the more chances a magic swordsman has to attack his opponent with more spells. Oluan's sword was ready to cut Jin's throat, releasing the helmet. The sword should have smoothly passed through the flesh, but instead something stopped it. This was because Jin activated his newly acquired artifact to create a black helmet. That's why every knight dreamed of taking possession of this artifact. It was the only helmet that could completely negate the impact of a knight of the seventh rank. The helmet stopped the blade of a luck, which caused the man to lose his balance. Jin took advantage of this opportunity. Bradamante cut the bandit's shoulder. He could have pierced the heart, but Jin stopped his sword. Barely breathing, a luck fell to the ground, and he managed to delay his death a little longer. 